I want to thank uh, everybody who had a part in me coming to this historic gathering in this historic building. It's been a joy. I told someone it's been always been one of my great dreams to come and be at a, a Quaker friends meeting, even if it meant just sitting and being quiet. Uh, and that's because, you know, I know enough about history to know about the Society of Friends and the abolition campaigns that began long before the end of slavery in Britain. I know about George Fox, uh, 1657, and how he challenged those who had blacks and Indians as slaves and said, wait a minute, what about the equality of all people? Uh, I know about how uh, friends and Quakers saw it as their spiritual duty to be abolitionists. They didn't separate. This is, I'm spiritual when I'm sitting in the, in the meeting house and then over here I'm political, but that your spirituality should inform your politics. I know that Quakers became so strong in their abolition of slavery that you could be disowned <laughs> as a member of, of, of this particular body for holding slaves. I know about the great dissent um, and how because of your dissent, there were those that arrested Quakers and threw them out of the parliament and wouldn't let them stand, but you continued to keep on and to stand. Um, I know about in 1696, uh, William South Bay demanded a ban on slave ownership and importation, published his attacks in 1720s, and John Woolman, 1754, his tracks, all of those which laid the groundwork for the, for the great abolition movement. Um, I know about uh, a businessman who refused, one of yours, who refused to sell slave processed sugar. I'm not going to do it as a, as a commitment to my moral uh, um, standings. And Sophia Sturge, who, who went around, to somebody said, 3,000 households personally saying, don't eat this sugar that's been grown and, and cared for by slaves. I know about one of your writers, uh, Benjamin Lundy, who said the aim, the end aim of this publication is the total abolition of slavery. Died in 1839, he didn't see it, but he sowed the seeds. He sowed the seeds. I know about Lucretia Mott, a room named after her, uh, who was an anti-slavery advocate and women's rights advocate, which meant she also worked with, with um, Sojourner Truth. <laughs> And, um, and, 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 and Miss Canton, uh, and how she said, if our principles are right, why should we be cowards? Um, I know about the AFC and how so much of your work in the South was so important, Guilford College, and, and standing there in Guilford College and standing against deployment discrimination and, this, and segregation you were there when persons were killed by the Klan in broad daylight with the help of, of um, the police department in Greensboro. And you spread out over the South, Louisiana, Texas, Prince Edward County, Virginia. I know about your work here in North Philadelphia, how you said, look, we're going to get together with the U United Auto Workers and we're going to construct some racially mixed housing because you understood that racism wasn't just a Southern problem. And you took it on. Uh, you took it on. And I know about the great leader. People talk about Dr. King and Joe Lu John Lewis and Roy Wilkins and others. But if it wasn't for Brother Rustin, the march wouldn't have ever got out of the gate. <laughs> if it wasn't for Brother Rustin, nobody else could handle all those egos, put them in their place. <laughs> I, I suspect he wasn't a quiet Quaker that day, but... Uh, <laughs> Or maybe he was, and he, the way he looked, that made them all just say, wait a minute, because, you know, quiet folk can hurt you, too. I mean, I know y'all nonviolent. Y'all you know, know that joke about the Quaker, right? Y'all wouldn't be offended if I tell the joke about the Quaker. Said he was at home, and, and, he, and he and Sister Ruth were laying in bed, and, and uh, he heard something. And Sister Ruth said, I believe thou, some, someone is breaking in in our house. And he said, surely not, Sister Ruth. She said, I, I do believe someone, Brother Paul, is breaking in our house. So he got up, went to the door, and sure enough, there was a robber down there going through the cabinet, stealing their silver forks and knives. 
And he said, my, 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 somebody is breaking in our house. And the sister says, oh, what are we going to do? He says, oh, well, the Lord will work it out. It's my child. So he grabbed his musket <clears throat> that he had used to hunt squirrels and rabbits. And he knew he was nonviolent. So he went to the balcony. He excuse me, sir. And the guy was right. He said, excuse me, sir. The guy said, what do you want? He said, um, you're stealing our stuff that the Lord did provide. And the guy said, oh, go back to sleep. He said, you can't do nothing because you're nonviolent. And he said, I know I am nonviolent, but I thought I might warn you that I'm about to shoot where thou art standing. <laughs> so I don't know what Bayard Rustin said, but he made those folk get together. That's the point. That's the moral of that story. I don't know what he told them, but he brought those egos and he organized and he understood that the march had to be more than a one day thing in Washington, D.C. It had to be a call to go back home. As Dr. Said King said, we've come here to, to serve notice now, but we got to go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to North Carolina, knowing that one day we shall be free. Rustin said, my activism did not spring from me being black. Rather, it is rooted fundamentally in my Quaker upbringing and the values instilled in me by my grandparents who reared me. These values were based on the concept of a single human family and a belief that all members of that family are equal. 